service called in the apartment, the room, where the water to be reverted and through the table. He leads us into the apartment to keep up with the book of John, chapter 6, verses 53 and 54. It says, uh, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, drink his blood, and have the life in his own. He breathes by blood, he breathes by blood, and he breathes by life, and I will raise him up. Last day. It's a beautiful passage. It's a, a stumbling block to those who heard it in the day of Christ, and he left. But uh, all of the afternoon, I mean, it's, it's been difficult for her ever since. But let it not be a stumbling block. Because what it is saying is that we need to have a meeting in the fellowship of Christ. That in ancient times, when we offer the sacrifice, we communion with the God upon the altar. Christ has offered his sacrifice. He's saying, unless you commune with me, in my sacrifice. Yes, you are trusting in my body and blood. You have no part of me. But if you are trusting, if you have fellowship with me, if you have been united to me, then you have eternal life. He feeds us upon that life through his word and through the table. So give he to his grace now as Please, if you would, turn your Bibles to Psalm 121. As we continue our study of the Psalms of Ascent, we are at Psalm 121 uh, today. It's a part two. I, my intention is not to do part twos throughout this series. Um, however, we're doing that with this Psalm. So 121 is a text we began looking at last week. We're going to uh, do a, 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 somewhat of a, a, a review of the book. We'll dive into the text that to you last time. Um, this is indeed God's word. This is a section of scripture that God gave, as you know, and you knew, to his people to prepare, to worship God in Jerusalem um, for the three annual or the three yearly um, sacrifices that every Jewish man was required to go to. And then at the end of time went uh, to the temple. You had uh, um, 15 songs that you were to sing as you, as you went out there. So as we get out there, you went there with your mind fighting, with your mind in the right place to worship God. And, and so this is, has been this incredible section. It's a, as Spurgeon it, called it, it's a psalter with a psalter. Um, yeah, it really is. Um, but it also is, if you think of our uh, trek to Jerusalem, um, no, we don't do that anymore. But yeah, we are. We're, we're, by God's grace, we could say, and we're preparing to enter into the new Jerusalem, um, into the, the Jerusalem which is not of this world, and the new heavens and the new world. And so, um, this is very impactful for us as we uh, learn these songs, learn the, the theology of these songs to frame our lives, our lives as we work our way, as we walk with Christ unto um, the heavenly home. So, with that, let me invite you to stand here with me. Psalm 121 is to read out the word. Let's stand out of reverence and respect for the word of our King. Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From whence shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade upon your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard and going out from your coming in from this time forth and forever. Thus far we read the God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege of fellowshipping with you. Fellowshipping with the God who has not only created the camp of the covenant, says that we come here now. At this time of covenant renewal, where you just in as you did in Exodus 24, and your word was read, and your people responded, and, and that led to the glorious fellowship with you for the peace upon the, the love of the land. God, we come to stay now um, to hear the covenant words of our writing. And uh, Lord, give us the grace to hear and heed it, to appropriate it, and by your grace, Holy Spirit, be transformed. We trust this time to be now in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. 
Psalm 34, verse 8 says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes breath of it. 65, gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is compassionate. Lamentations 3. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's loving kindness and deed never cease. His compassion never fail. There in every morning, great is thy faithfulness. Romans 2 4. Do not think lightly of the rich ones, but God's kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing the kindness of God, leads you to repentance. Think about a few of the hundreds, perhaps thousands of passages. All of which proclaim the glory, the weightiness of God's goodness. So God is a gracious, kind, loving, caring God. And that, brothers and sisters, is this poor message for traveling pilgrims traveling to reach God. Because what we we might doubt God's love at times in our life. We might um, under by the downplay, we might even deny, uh, deny it. But the truth is in Scripture that by the shadow of a doubt, God is a loving God, a kind God, a caring God. It's not to be more. It's clearly what God would teach us. And that's the message of Psalm 121. Recall the very first Psalm began in the diaspora, in the wilderness, amongst non believers. And he sings it, that, that song is to be sung within the focus of that, on the burdens that come upon God's people living in a world that's built in fashion on deceit. Right? They, uh, it's, it's a world uh, that has been uh, created since the fall by the prince and power of the air. And so we live in a world that's filled with lies and half truths. And if, if we would seek to serve the Lord and be faithful, that will mean war. Tell this song in, right? As it is, I am for peace. I am preaching the word of God. Join me. The word is the middle syllable of the entire psalm. So the word shamar is right in the middle, which says this is the emphasis of this song. When you sing of, about the burdens of living in this world, secondly, sing about the glory of God's care. That's what Psalm 121 does. Now, I want to expand our definition. I just briefly introduced you to this word last week. Let me expand it for you briefly this morning. The word uh, 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 shamar has a twofold emphasis in Scripture. It's one coin, two sides, okay? The first side, as you've got it in your bulletin, the first nuance carries the idea of personal care, which watches over something to protect and preserve it. Personal care to protect and and uh, preserve. If your Bibles are open or your, your electronic media, go to Genesis 2 verse 15. First time this word is found in scripture, it's found in Genesis 2 15, where we read these words. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Edom to cultivate it and to keep it. That's our word. The word cultivate, that means in the Hebrew to plow a field. That's the word used to plow a field. That's the word used to make uh, threads, uh, to make fabric. That's the word used to build a city. Okay, so that's not what the word keep means. The word keep means once you've plowed the field and planted the seeds, the word keep, shamar, carries the idea of personalized care. Where you're going to, to, to get nice and close with that, with that growing uh, crop. Where you weed it and you water it and you feed it and you tend it and you care it. That it might grow up to be what it's intended to be. That's the word shamar. It speaks of a personalized protection, perseverance, feeding, and care. That whatever it's being uh, kept will become what it should be. Okay, the second word or a second time this verse, this word is found still under this definition is Genesis chapter 3, 24. So if you would uh, turn there, this also adds to the definition. Genesis 3, 24 is after God's people have sinned Adam and Eve. Adam's cast out of the garden with Eve. We read, so he drove the man out of the garden. And, to the, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, God stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way, that's our word, to the tree of life. So this refers to protection. 
So I referenced this last time as the main definition, but I skipped over the first one. And that is, it's protection. It's, it's, it's standing guard. So combined, the first nuance of this term speaks of a personalized care so that whatever you're caring for becomes what God wants it to be, but done in such a way that you're standing guard over it as a soldier, as the captain of the Lord of hosts. That's the first nuance of this word. That's the one side. The second side of the coin um, is found in Deuteronomy 7. So if you want to turn there and you've got it in your bulletin or your notes, there is a second nuance to this word, which in the context of a formal relationship speaks of the upholding of one's covenant responsibility. Very important. This word when you read of God's covenant, which is the thing that, that, that tra um, uh, uh, transcends all of Scripture, all of redemptive history, from Genesis 3.15, the establishment of what we call the first gospel, the proto-evangelium, right? Genesis 3.15, uh, the rest of Scripture unveils this glorious commitment, this covenant, this relationship God has with his people. The word used in the Bible to reference the upholding of that covenant is our word shamar. Listen to Deuteronomy 7. Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand generations. That's the word. So when you hear the word, you're, you're Jewish, you know Hebrew, um, in this culture day, you hear the word shamar, it is vivid. It's a big word. It's the covenant word. It's the word that God, that, that, that is used of God protecting us, uh, guiding us, nourishing us, feeding us, um, um, standing guard over us. But then there's more to it. Because it's the covenant word, it reminds us of the covenant commitment of God to us. And there's a lot of facets. We could spend, honestly, a whole sermon on this. The one fast I'm going to bring out to your attention is, is the facet in Deuteronomy 9, where, or uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 7 and 9, where we read Deuteronomy 9. Moses said, Know then, it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God has given you this good land to possess, for you are a stubborn people. Brothers and sisters, God's covenant is unilateral. God's relationship with us is all based upon what he does, and therefore it's unconditional. So Shamar carries with it not only personalized protection and care where God stands watch over us, but secondly, it's unconditional care. It's not predicated upon anything you do, say, think, or become. It's not because you're good. It's not because you've done good things. Oftentimes when bad things happen to us, what's the first thing that we think of as God's people? Because of our default program, because of our performance base, the first thing that happens when bad things happen to us, after a bit, we go, why, God? What haven't I not done? Where have I failed you? And if you and I have been pretty faithful the last week or two and bad things happen, we can shake our fists and say, why are you doing this? You're not fair, Job, right? Book of, of Job. Brothers and sisters, this word shamar uh, yells from the mountaintops. That is pagan thinking. God's care for you is not predicated upon what you do. God's care for you will never be based upon your faithfulness to him. That's the word shamar. It's the theme of this psalm. So you and I are living this difficult world in which we live, a world based upon lies where we get persecuted and attacked and a world that's, that's, that's suffering the pains of childbirth uh, uh, together until now, Romans 8, because of the sinful state of, 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 in which we live. So we have hard times and difficult times come. God wants us to know, second song right out of the gate, don't you dare think it's because of what you've done. It's not because you have failed me. It's because you live in a state of sin and misery. We're going to return back to this, okay? The next, the subsequent psalms are going to help us further. But at this point, the second song is, frame your thinking, shamar. Your whole song is about shamar, about God keeping his people. Now, this song, this song has four stanzas. The first three stanzas are, are parallel. They, they are very similar. The fourth stanza, which we're going to get to at the end, would be in our modern language, the bridge. We would normally put the fourth stanza, verses seven and eight, between the second and third stanza. 
in our singing. They chose to put it at the end. So I'm going to review with you the first two stanzas that we've seen, and then we're going to look at the third stanza of this song. The first stanza that God has, now that you, now that you understand what Shamar is, now notice how this psalm describes it. So we're going to pick up this diamond called Shamar, and each stanza is looking at it from a different angle, okay? First angle, God's care, God's shamar, results in unthwartable assistance. This is review. Verse one, I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. Do you remember the word mountain there is used negatively? It could be, it could be positive, but in the context of the psalm, it's clearly negative. He, the mountains here are not the good things. The mountains here are bad things. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. And the reason why they lift them up is because they're climbing up the mountain to get to Jerusalem. It was up in the mountains. So I'm going to lift up my eyes into these, these mountains, these foreboding mountains. And the mountains in Psalm 121 are the burdens of Psalm 120. That's what we saw last time. So the mountains here are cancer. The mountains here are persecution. The mountains here are lost jobs. The mountains here are, are conflict. And our tendency in conflict and difficulties is to lift up our eyes to cancer and we're going to rise up to it and, and cure this thing. Horizontal. What does the psalmist say? When you get confronted with the burdens of life, the first thing you must lift your eyes to are not to the burdens. Don't you live your life in light of the burdens. How many Christians are defined by their sin? By the mud puddle they just climbed out of? How many people allow themselves in Christ to be defined by their failures? By what happens to them? Their victimized state. Our culture is filled with that right? Reparations. That's what defines us, right? Brothers and sisters, God wants you and me to not be defined by what we do or what's happened to us. What does he say? I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From whence does my help come? My help doesn't come from the mountain. Nothing in those mountains, not a stick, not a rock is my uh, defense against the bad guys. No, my, I will lift up my eyes uh, um, up to God. Where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord. And then he qualifies it by saying the maker of heaven and earth. Do you remember that? Brothers and sisters, there are over 200 billion galaxies with over 200 billion planets and stars. And in Genesis 1, God spoke one word and all of that came into existence. Psalm 121, 2 is saying God's care is so great that the power and, and authority and sovereignty that God used to create the world, God exercises to protect you and cause you to grow in grace. So the first point we see of God's care, God's care results in unthwartable assistance in our walks with God. Secondly, God's care, three through four, another review, results in constant stability. Notice he will not allow your foot to slip. And the idea behind this is not, you're not going to have some unsteady times in your life, right? The, 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 the righteous falls down seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in times of calamity. The slipping here is a slipping unto death, a slipping unto, right? You're climbing up the mountain, you slip, oh, right? That's not going to happen. We may stumble, we, our feet may, may, get, may at times slip, but we're not going to perish. That's the idea behind number two. God's care results in constant stability. Why? Because he will not slumber. When I today did, do a survey and ask, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of God, you'd probably think love or you'd think transcendence, his holiness, whichever, right? In the ancient world, if you came up to somebody and said, when you think of God, what's the first thing that you, that you th uh, think of? Most likely you would think a capriciousness. Now you go, well, what does that mean? That means they're not, um, they're, they're here today, they're gone tomorrow, they're not dependable. Why? Because it was believed that God slept. The gods went on journeys. So one of the markers of the ancient world about God was that the gods slumbered and slept. And that explains why bad things happen to you. Yeah, your God's in charge, but you just got hurt. Well, that's because he was sleeping. He's taking a nap. Not so with God. That's what this text says. He will not allow your foot to slip. He neither slumbers nor sleeps. He's with you, walking with you, beside you, before you, within you, protecting you, growing you, nurturing you, standing guard over you at all times. We may sleep, but God never sleeps. All right, that's the second stanza. Second angle that we're looking at this glorious diamond called care, shamar. Now that brings us to the new ground, which we have not gotten to yet. Verse five, notice with me. The Lord is your keeper. That's our word. Okay, covenant, 
God protecting us unconditionally, not based upon what we do, but based upon his own character. The Lord is your keeper. And then he modifies it by saying, the Lord is your shade on your right hand. So he says, he's your keeper. Now I'm focusing on one facet of this care. And that's the fact that he's the shade on your right hand. And you go, what is that? Okay, so you're walking from Babylon in the diaspora up through the Fertile Crescent, down through Palestine, into the mountains where Jerusalem's going to be. That walk's about a five-month walk. I remember as a kid going home from the summer, it was summer, it was swimming. I was out in the sun all day. And I know, and now I look back, I was dehydrated. But I'm walking home. It's a mile at the most. At the most, it was one mile. And I remember walking home, and I just started wilting like a flower, right? Out of water. I'm just, I get a headache. It's so bright on the sidewalk. I'm getting dizzy. I'm feeling nauseated. I want to throw up. And I remember going, oh, I wasn't saved. I'm just thinking, someone help me. I was all by myself. And I had, and so I would come up on the, the sidewalk. There'd be shade from trees. And I'd just sit there. And I'd be relieved, but I still had to get home because I knew if I got home, I'd be safe. I'd get water, whatever it was. Brothers and sisters, if you're traveling from Babylon to Palestine, we're not talking one mile home. We're talking six months of, of walking. Well, you, if you know anything about the geography of Palestine, you know that that fertile crescent in that area is a hothouse. It's awful. You're walking in desert, not across the desert. You had to go up around, but it's still bad. So you're a little kid, you're a child of, of God and you're walking and you're weak. Your body can't process the heat and the shining bright. And so you start feeling the headache. You start feeling nauseated. You start feeling dizzy. You start feeling weak. And so you start falling back and you say, mom and dad, I can't go any further. What do they do? They grab you by the hand. And because it's some completely son, what does your father or mother do? They put you on their shade side on the right side. You walk in their shade. And while that may still be hot, it's nothing like it was in the bright, shiny sun. That's the idea here. The relief, the restoration, the um, refreshment that comes from getting out of the bright sun, the hot sun, the scorching sun. It says here, the Lord is what you walk in to protect you. He's your shade on your right hand. That's where he, that's so, so thirdly, when you think of God's care for us, it's personal protection. You're walking with God. You're in his shade, the shade of the Lord. He's so close to you, holding your hand. He's casting the shade over your journey of life on this side of the grave. Unconditionally, never disgusted, never turning his back upon you, never leaving you. You're walking in the shade of Christ. Psalm 23 is a beautiful picture of this. Psalm 23, 4, where it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Remember Barnhouse's illustration on, on that, the, 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 the shadow of, of death? You go, what is the, the valley of shadow of death? Quickly, Barnhouse's wife died. He had three little, three or four little kids. They're coming home from the funeral on a, on a, on, on a one lane um, highway, you know, uh, in two direction. And they're driving and the kids are in mourning. They're all in the uh, days and a massive semi passes them on the road. And you've had that time, head-on-head -head traffic, where a massive car, uh, you know, truck go, uh, goes by and makes your car swerve. It makes a loud noise. The whole car shakes. Well, it, it, it shook them out of their, their grief. And the kids went, ah, screamed. And Barnhouse, master illustrator, took that as an opportunity to say, daughters, would you have been, which would you prefer, to be hit by the shadow of that truck or to be hit by the truck? And they said, well, it's shadow, Dad, because they just got hit by its shadow. And he said, that's what mom was hit by. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And what, what does that mean? Well, 1 Corinthians, when the perishable will put on the imperishable, the immortal with the immortality, then will come about the saying written, death is swallowed up in victory of death. Where is your victory of death? Where is your sting? In Christ, we die, but, we, but the sting of death, hell, is gone. Our death means the moment we die, we're in the presence of, of God. So with Paul, we say, I don't know what to do. Whether to remain on in the flesh is good for you or to, to die and be with, with Christ because death is better by far. Which do I uh, prefer? The shadow of death. Brothers and sisters, God is always with you. And because he's always with you, even the worst 
possible thing that could ever happen to any one of us would be hell. Right? That's gone. We are in God's shade. We are, we are walking in the shade of God such that we enjoy it. So verse six, the sun will, thus will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. That's a merism, a literary tool. So it's a merism. Stuart, a couple, I don't know how long ago it was. I remember his sermon. He defined this formally for you. Merism where you take the extremes to basically denote if the extremes are true, everything in between is true. So it's, for example, Deuteronomy 3, what God is there in heaven or earth, as far as you can go in the heavens, all the way down the earth and everywhere in between. That's a merism. You take the outer boundaries, right? The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. You go, well, how would the moon smite me by night? I've never seen anybody die of exhaustion because they were of the moon. That's not the point. The point is, no matter where you are or what you're doing, you're with God. And because you're with God, nothing will be able to get you except that which goes through the providential will of God. And God's good. And therefore, everything going on in our lives is done according to God's shamar, his care, his personal protection for us. All right, that's the song he wants us to sing. Now, he closes with this bridge. And the bridge is designed to, to, to be a catch-all, and you'll see it ends that way, with regards to the future. This is what is now. One through six is a description of you and I today, right now in our lives. One through six. Seven through eight, on the other hand, is a description of what's going to happen tomorrow. Okay, this is the bridge. So notice with me verse seven, no matter what is against us, God will always be with us and watch over us. Notice with me verse seven, the Lord will protect you from all evil. The word evil here is raw. Okay, it is the opposite of the Hebrew word tov. So for example, listen to Deuteronomy 30. See, I've set before you today life and prosperity, tov, death and ra, adversity. The word ra can refer, just like tov, can refer to that which is essence, essentially good or essentially bad. So Satan would be ra, okay? God is tov, he's good. Um, however, it's a broad range. So good, tov can also refer to anything that has a beneficial result. And raw can also refer to anything that has a bad result. And so it can be translated adversity, calamity, and that's the and context of what dictates it. This context clearly is talking not about Satan. God will protect you from all calamity on your road, on your path. Robbers, thieves, um, bad weather, um, ill health, physical weakness, all of it, God's going to protect you from any and all adversity and calamity. Now, brothers and sisters, that doesn't mean he's not saying he's going to keep you from it. He's not going to let you have it. He's saying that in, involved with all of these trials and difficulties of life, he's going to preserve your soul. That's the idea by uh, Shamar. It's not to keep us from things. It's to keep us from death, from what would be bad. It's to keep us from not growing in the bad things. So you think of shamar being used as a, as a farming term. There are droughts. To shamar would be to bring water and personally water each, each plant. But it's a drought. You're not doing a very good job. Well, I can't control the, the droughts. I can't control armies coming through and trampling. But once it's trampled, I'm going to come and I'm going to tend to each one of my little saplings and, and care for it. That's the idea. So God won. No matter what is against us, God is going to keep us. No matter what, even if it's Satan. Secondly, no matter who we are, you go, you know what? I trust God to, cover, to protect me from all the things of the world. But my problem is within. I have, I'm a man of doubts. I have a weak faith. I'm timid Timothy. I struggle in my Christian walk. I struggle with believing. I struggle with trusting. You know, can God protect me from me? That's the second one. No matter who we are, the Lord will protect you from all, all evil. He will keep, that's our word, your soul. The word is nefesh, or nefesh, nefesh. Onomatopoetic word, nefesh. And it sounds the way it is. So when you hear someone breathing, you know, it sounds like nefesh. That's a not, okay. So that word was used when God created the world and made mud out of the ground and formed man. That's the word used 
For in Genesis 2, where it says that God breathes into man life. And therefore, this word nephesh carries the idea of the essence of what we are. God will protect the essence of who you are. And we're not talking about you and your perfect state. We're talking about you today, who you are. You have a sense of humor. You're serious. You're weak. You're given to timidity. You're given to boldness and pride. God's going to protect you from all of, the, all of the pitfalls that your personality is going to lead you to. He's going to protect you from, from, from all of those things. That's the idea. He's going to protect you from yourself. Um, that's the idea. Notice Spurgeon's quote. You've got it there. Um, God is the soul keeper of the soul. Our soul is kept from the dominion of sin, the infection of air, the crush of despondency, the puffing up of pride, kept from the world, the flesh, the devil, kept from, from holier and greater things, kept in the love of God, kept into the eternal kingdom and glory. What can harm a soul that is kept of the Lord? So the idea behind this one, the emphasis is God will keep even you. So I've talked with, with people, you, you know Romans 8, right? Neither in height nor depth nor angels will be able to separate us from the love of God. I've talked with people and say, yeah, but it didn't say me. Then send me in that verse so I can choose not to choose God and lose my salvation. You can't, brothers and sisters, because you didn't do anything for your salvation. It's done externally outside of you. Um, and in this verse, if you want to proof text many other ver verses we, we can give, this is one of them. Not even you can stop you from God's care. You can't thwart God's love for you. You can't stop him from loving you. Nothing can. And that care includes even who you are. Your weaknesses, your, your, your failings, your strengths, your uh, tendencies. Thirdly, would you notice, no matter where we are in our journey, verse 8, the Lord will guard your going out and your coming in. I love this one. This is another merism, okay? From the beginning of the journey, the moment you open the door from your little village in Babylon and step out from that moment, to when you go to Jerusalem, come all the way back home and step in and shut the door behind you, that entire journey, God is going to protect you. The entire time, God is walking with you, protecting you through it all. Incredible. Now, for you and I, we're 2,000 years, 2,500 years, more than that, from when this psalm was written. And this psalm was written about God's people physically worshiping in Jerusalem. Well, we're going to apply this to our time when we are going to physically worship God in the new Jerusalem. So therefore, our going out would be when we're converted. Whether that was when you were in the womb, whether that was you as a young child, or whether that was you as a 50-year-old man becoming or a woman becoming saved. When you're newly uh, converted, what are you? Well, you're a newbie. <laughs> you're young. Even though you're old, you're young, right? So foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child because of youth. Isaiah 40, um, youths grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly. So one of the things that characterizes us in our walks with God is we got to begin. Well, guess what? God's going to protect you there. The folly of youth, the silly thoughts that you have, name it. God's protecting you there. He's going to protect you as you go from youth to young man or woman to, to father, mother, and the faith all the way up to the moment you embark upon the most difficult journey and call of your life, and that's the call of, of, of old age. Even there, God is going to uh, protect you. Isaiah 46, 4, even to your old age, I shall be the same. Even to your graying years, I shall bear you. I have done it. I will carry you. I will bear you. I will deliver you. Brothers and sisters, God's, the, this fourth one or, or third one is, <laughs> brothers and sisters, you and I are pro, uh, protected on this uh, journey. No matter where we are in our faith walk, you will be uh, protected. And lastly, this, this bridge, no matter whatever else comes our, our way, it ends in verse 8b. The Lord will guard you going out. You're coming in from this time forth and forever. So another merism. From this moment, not when you get to heaven, but all the way through heaven to the end of eternity. And you go, Greg, you can't talk like that because eternity, by definition, doesn't have an end. That's the idea. He's going to protect you from this moment. Everything else. One commentary said this is perhaps the most encouraging line of this entire psalm. Because it's, it's from this point on, everything, no matter who you are, where you are, what you're doing, all of it is protected by God. Incredible, brothers and sisters. Why? Because of God's care for you, his people. 
his love for you. Brothers and sisters, do you know one of the, the most frequent words used to describe a Christian in the New Testament? It's not Christian. You know, it's only used three times the word Christian, twice derogatorily, third time neutrally. Okay. Um, what was the primary word? Well, disciple would be one you might choose. There might be a couple words you might cho choose. Do you know a word that's used 20 times of us throughout Scripture, throughout the New uh, Testament? I'll read it. It's, it's Second Thessalonians 2. Dearly beloved of the Lord. Now, it's easy to read that verse, beloved of God. And go, whatever, it's just words. No, do, do you understand what that means? That's Psalm 121. You are the loved of God. Unconditionally. That's Psalm 121. You live in a harsh world. It's not friendly to grace. It's not going to help us on our way. It's going to beat us down and seek to destroy our faith. But God's love is going to bear and carry you through it all. Because you, your identity, is the love of God. That God loves you. That you're the beloved of God. I saw, I, I think, a rather, it was in the context of, of you and me, it's great. But in the context of the world, well, maybe it's not. I won't derogatory. But a professor in economics stood up to his class. He had, he had a $20 bill and said, who wants this? Everyone raised their hand. It's a beautiful, crisp $20 bill. He took it and folded it and said, who wants it now? They all raised their hand. He shriveled it up. He said, who wants it now? They all raised their hand. He put it on the ground, stepped on it with his dirty feet, picked it back up and said, who wants it? They all raised their hand. And he said, let me teach you a valuable lesson. The value of this tender didn't change by what it was treated like. Brothers and sisters, let me teach you a valuable lesson. Your value as a child of God is not predicated upon what you do, who you are, what you think, name it. It's based upon God's value of you. And you were so valuable, he gave up his son that you might live. So brothers and sisters, understand this psalm. Sing it to yourself. Teach it to yourself. Teach it to your children. I don't mean literally, although it wouldn't be a bad idea. But the content, you and I are valuable to God. Trials and difficulties do not testify to our value. The cross of Christ does. And because of that cross work of Christ, this psalm can be written about God's unconditional care for you and me. Now, that being said, let me close with these thoughts. Psalm 120, Psalm 121 clearly indicate we're going to go through trial. You can't live in a world of deceit as someone who's, who's in the truth and not be persecuted. You're going to be persecuted. Passively, by the ads you see and the worldview that you hear that makes you go like Lot, it's burdening my soul. I'm sick of these lies, right? Or actively, because you're a Christian, we're firing you. Because you believe those things, we're going to get rid of you, whatever. We're going to have trials, but the point of Psalm 120, 121, I've referenced this last time, is this. Don't miss this. So do worldlings. Non-believers go through trial. They die of cancer. They lose children. They get divorced. Horrible things happen to them. The difference between you and, 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 and them, between us and the non-believer who has no hope, is the presence of Almighty God in your life. He is the shade in which you walk. This glorious God is with you at all times. I close with the words of Eugene uh, Peterson and his, again, classic study on the Psalms of Ascent. Long obedience to the same uh, direction. He wrote these words. The Christian life is not a quiet escape to a garden where we can walk and talk uninterruptedly with our Lord nor a fantasy trip to a heavenly city where we can compare blue ribbons and gold medals with others who have made it to the winner's circle. The Christian life is going to God. In going to God, Christians travel the same ground that everyone else walks on, breathe the same air, drink the same water, shop in the same stores, read the same newspapers, are citizens under the same governments, pay the same prices for groceries and gasoline, fear the same dangers, are subject to the same pressures, get the same distresses, are buried in the same ground. The difference is that each step we walk, each breath we breathe 
We know we are preserved by God. We know we are accompanied by God. We know that we are ruled by God. And therefore, no matter what doubts we endure or what accidents we experience, the Lord will preserve us from all evil. He will keep our life. May God give us the grace to learn this song. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for this second song that you've taught us to sing. A song clearly that was given to frame our thinking as we sojourn as pilgrims in this barren land. God, I pray for your people. We who've sat under this psalm this day, God, I pray you give us the grace to cast off doubt, to fight the good fight of faith. Lord, we, we, that text tells us it's going to be a war to trust you and not trust our flesh's inclinations. The thoughts that pass through our minds in the middle of the night, Lord, I pray you give us the grace to be done with that, to be active in our thinking. And therefore, Lord, to watch over our hearts with all diligence. That we would not allow the, the horrible thoughts that, that come in from just Psalm 120, uh, just a knowledge of, of only Psalm 120, that, well, if God loved me, why didn't he care for me? God loved me, why do I have trials and difficulties? God, give us the grace to frame our thinking that Psalm 121 would be a song that we would sing back to those thoughts, where we would tell our soul, soul, God is a good God, a loving God who cares for, you, for me. Soul, God, God is a God who, sta who stationed himself uh, over my soul, where, in which I walk in his shade to protect and groom me and grow me to be the man or the woman he's called me to be. God, give us the grace to learn this song, to boldly sing this song until the day you call us home when faith is dissolved into sight. We pray this, O Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.